Uh, Mark is a pathologist by training who has come full circle after a pretty varied and interesting career. He was a bioinformatician at NCBI during the 1990s, one of the architects of GenBank and uh, many other key resources for our community. He was a neuroscientist and, neuro, uh, and uh, institute director, at the founding director of the Paul Allen Brain Atlas in Seattle, and that's in that capacity he gave a keynote here a few years ago. Uh, he was a director of functional genomics and systems biology at Novartis uh, uh, in Cambridge uh, for a couple of years. Um, he's a part-time entrepreneur. We may hear a little bit about some of those activities in a second. Um, and uh, he's now, as we profiled in BioIT World late last year, a pathologist uh, back in the pathology department at Beth Israel Hospital in Boston, where he's playing one of a, a real leadership uh, a spearheading role, uh, getting uh, the next generation of uh, physicians and pathologists uh, up to speed uh, in, the, in the wonderful world of, of personal genomics and personalized medicine. So great pleasure to welcome uh, Mark. He, Mark his title, Mark's title is The Goody Gaga Effect, Health Communication at the Nexus of Social Media and Popular Culture. Welcome back, Mark. I'm not gonna talk about my day job today, which Kevin alluded to. I'm actually gonna talk more about my hobby. And um, as is abundantly clear, I think, from Ben Haywood's talk just now, we live in an age of empowered patients and participatory medicine. And that's the subject, subject I'm going to talk about today. Uh, those empowered patients and those who participate meaningfully in their own health care is still a very tiny fraction of the people who could actually benefit from this. I'm amazed to see that uh, patients like me has 100,000 uh, clients now. Uh, but there are 330 million people in this country, two-thirds of which are affected by uh, overweight, obesity, diabetes, et cetera. Uh, and there's a lot of work to do to get those patients, th that population, engaged. So the reason we need to do that is because the only real solution to uh, uh, health care costs is, uh, as insurance companies say, cost avoidance. And by cost avoidance, don't get sick in the first place or when you do. Uh, make sure you're getting the most efficient, cost-effective uh, management of those chronic illnesses as possible. So that's why we need to do it. How we do that is the subject, main subject of my talk, and we can do that in part by leveraging what's called the Goody Gaga effect. Uh, this is a, these are a couple of books that represent the empowered patient uh, phenomenon. Uh, the one on, on your left is written by Elizabeth Cohen. Uh, it came out just a few months ago, and it's on the bestseller list from Amazon. And this sends shivers through, I'm sure, pharma companies when she's telling you how to buy the cheapest drugs and beat your insurance company, et cetera. Uh, the problem with this approach is that you're already a patient by the time you need this advice. You're already sick. Uh, in contrast, I think Thomas Goetz takes a little different point of view, is that by quantitative monitoring of our own physiological parameters, if you will, we can avoid disease, minimize uh, the incidence of it, and more effectively management, if manage it once we do uh, come down with something. How do we do that? We do that with those ubiquitous mobile computing platforms that all of you have in your pockets or are tweeting on right now. Uh, this is one of the offerings that we've developed in this area. Uh, it's called PhotoCalorie. Uh, it's a way to track your uh, dietary intake and, and weight, uh, but it can also be used to manage chronic diet-related diseases like obesity. I'm not going to say much more about it today, but we will be talking about it uh, extensively at the Microsoft Connected Health Conference in Chicago in two weeks and how, about how we've interfaced this with Microsoft Health Vault. The participatory medicine is, uh, movement is only about four years old, uh, and there is a society for participatory medicine. I would encourage you all to join. It's 50 bucks a year for an individual membership and 250 for a company membership, and you get to peer over the shoulders of people who are at the vanguard of this. Uh, by participating in their society. Uh, one of the founders of that movement and the most famous e-patient today is e-patient Dave DeBronckhart. Uh, e-patient Dave uh, developed, uh, he was diagnosed with uh, stage four metastatic kidney cancer in 2006, a disease with an average life expectancy of six months. Uh, he's still alive today, testifying before Congress on the empowered patient movement. Uh, because he became an empowered patient, he informed himself and he sought out the best treatments at centers of excellence, which increased considerably his chance for a long-term remission from, from late-stage metastatic cancer. Uh, his book is called Laugh, Sing, and Eat Like a Pig. Uh, this was actually the prescription that his primary care practitioner wrote for him because he said, Dave, when you go on chemotherapy, you're going to lose 20 pounds. Why not gain it first? And then when, you know, when your chemotherapy is over, it'll be, <laughs> it'll be net zero. And there are, <laughs> 
Uh, there are similar stories behind the laughing and, and singing things, but I think you get that. So Dave is a very assertive, sophisticated, engaged guy, but like, what about the rest of us, you know? Uh, is health even on our minds most of the time? Well, I, I think you know the answer. Only when we get sick do we really pay attention to it. Uh, every year, Yahoo publishes its top 10 search terms for the previous year, and as you can see from this article, 70% of them involve celebrities. Uh, a couple on the BP oil spill and the World Cup and stuff like that, but all the rest of them uh, were this sort of apparently frivolous uh, cultural phenomenon uh, exemplified by uh, Cletus there. Uh, so is there any redeeming social value in any of this obsession with celebrity culture that we seem to have, not only in the US but worldwide? Is there any way we can use this for health education? Well, if, according to Dan Olds from Beaverton, or Oregon, the internet is not an effective place for, inter for learning anything because people are just focused on this stuff. Uh, anyway, uh, early critics of the phenomenon of celebrity would agree that it's a frivolous phenomenon. Daniel Borstein, the, the critic, said that a celebrity is a person well-known for their well-knownness. Uh, <clears throat> and Andy Warhol said everyone in the future will have 15 minutes of fame. That's certainly come true now. Uh, how many people watched American Idol last night? Only one guy was, <laughs> everyone else is embarrassed. Do you know that one of the contestants has inflammatory bowel disease, and he's overcome that to become an idol on uh, a contestant? Anyway, we can go into that later. <laughs> later scholars, such as Graham Turner, have looked at the phenomenon of celebrity in a more dispassionate, uh, less elitist uh, manner, and shown that it has important social functions in the formation of cultural identity, as a mode of, mode of discourse that results in pleasurable social exchange. This is the around the water cooler talk about what was on TV last night. And in the construction of community, uh, Hamish Pringle, who's the director general of the Institute for the Practitioners of Advertising in the UK, says, and I quote, the role that celebrity plays in people's lives goes beyond a voyeuristic form of entertainment, but actually fulfills an extremely important social function, research and development function for them as individuals and for society at large. People use celebrities as role models and guides, whether we like it or not. So how do you leverage this ubiquitous cultural phenomenon? How do you take that attention span where seven out of 10 of the top internet searches about celebrities and leverage that to teach something about health, increase health awareness, increase medical knowledge? You, use it, you do it using teachable, the phenomenon of teachable moments. Now, these have been around for a long time, since the 50s. Uh, they've been thought in the past to be direct personal life experiences. Uh, uh, shared through real-time social interactions. However, our hypothesis, you know, in fact, the basis of our work is that these teachable moments, these events don't have to be direct personal experiences, but can be vicarious asynchronous interactions mediated by social networking technologies. To test this hypothesis, we developed a, a website of teachable moments in medicine or the medical facts behind the headlines, if you will. It doesn't only cover, you know, the Hollywood types, but business celebrities like Steve Jobs, we've covered the Pope, uh, we talk about people from science and politics and, and other, other forms of, of public figures who have diseases that we can all identify with and we can all learn something from. Uh, you'd be surprised how many celebrities get sick. In the last two years of running this site, we've developed, we've written over 700 stories about celebrity illnesses representing more than 250 different disease conditions and about a quarter of a million people see our stories every month. Uh, what makes us think that any of this will matter uh, in terms of health behavior change? Is it just a voyeuristic form of entertainment? Well, we hope not, and uh, which gives us some confidence that we're, we're achieving some uh, positive outcome, is that our work is based on established theories and practice of health behavior change, uh, social cognitive uh, theory in, in the health belief model. Kinsey developed a five-step framework for developing instructional materials. The framework steps are on the left, gain attention, present stimulus material, provide learning guidance, elicit performance, feedback, and enhance retention and transfer. For one of the steps, we use our system resounding health, which uh, is two things. It's a knowledge base which uh, has captured non-copyrighted government consumer health information from 30 different siloed government websites all over the internet and integrated for the first time in a one-stop shop for government health information but it's also a toolkit to allow patients to collect, organize, personalize, and share that information, supplement it with their information that, that's personalized for them. There's also a celebrity, uh, I'm sorry, a professional edition of celebrity diagnosis. Why is that? Why should professional healthcare providers be interested in it? Because physician office calls 
the volumes increase in association with celebrity health news. And healthcare providers, you know, people are sitting in the waiting room reading People magazine, and then they go in and ask their doctor about it. And they're usually clueless about what's in the media. So we got approached by the CEO of MedPage Today, which is now a wholly owned subsidiary of Everyday Health, and said, listen, we think there's an audience for professional healthcare providers for this too. Here's an example from the Super Bowl. This Super Bowl commercial went viral after it was shown. Turns out that little kid playing Darth Vader uh, survived a very serious congenital heart defect called Tetralogy of Fallot. And it gives people hope and inspiration to see that someone with such a severe pediatric condition can actually become an actor. So this has lots of different benefits besides just educating people about the disease. It teaches them how to cope and gives them uh, role models in a positive way. So what is the Goody Gaga effect? It's a sharp increase in the volume of search engine traffic for specific diseases or medical conditions that correlates with a celebrity association with that disease or condition. It's named after Jade Goody, uh, who, is a, who was the late Jade Goody, who was a reality TV show star personality in the UK. She was on a show called Big Brother. After she became famous as a result of that show, she developed cervical cancer. And as a role model for other women to get screening and uh, deal with the disease, she decided to live out the remainder of her life in the public eye, allowing people to track her progress and her setbacks and eventually her death. However, uh, and statistics that have been published since then have shown that uh, screening for cervical cancer in the National Health, Inst um, National Health Service went way up every time something about her was in the news. However, there was also a missed opportunity too, because in none of those news coverage at all was there anything about preventing cervical cancer through an available vaccine, Gardasil. This effect is also named after Lady Gaga. Um, last June, she announced that she had borderline lupus. We learned in retrospect that lupus was the fifth most popular search term on Google later that month, and there's a direct correlation between her celebrity, her illness, and people searching for more information about that disease. Summary and conclusions, um, I'm going to quote Baron Lerner who wrote a book called When Illness Goes Public. The public increased their knowledge of topics and conditions not because they were seeking health information but rather as a consequence of their primary interest in celebrities' lives. Media coverage of celebrities contains little material that conveys useful health information. Uh, you know, the average depth and accuracy of something in USA Today or People magazine is not that great, hence the need for the medical facts behind the headlines. Uh, Catherine Smith at the Hopkins School, uh, Bloomberg School of Public Health concluded that uh, media attention to such newsworthy events is a missed opportunity that can and should be addressed. Lastly, pharma and, uh, and biotech can leverage this consumer activism, uh, combine it with genetic information and social networking to create new opportunities for drug repurposing and repositioning. We wrote about this a couple of years ago, uh, laying out a program uh, how post-marketing surveillance could actually be turned into something positive, not just to look for adverse side effects, but potential new benefits that weren't anticipated uh, when the drug was first produced. I'll end there. For more visit, visit our, visit our websites, and I thank you for your time and attention.